So in close-up today, we're looking at Steven Spielberg's Jaws, which was released in 1975. There are a couple of reasons why Jaws gets its special place in this segment. The movie itself changed the landscape of cinema as we know it. And really, that's not an exaggeration. Jaws really came around at a time when Hollywood was looking to reinvent itself, and uh, the film almost single-handedly reinvented it. On the one hand, it's a humble film about a shark that attacks a community. It is formulaic. It is absolutely generic mainstream cinema, which is why it made $100 million on a $10 million investment. But if we look beneath the surface of these stories and characters that seem so familiar to us, we get a brief glimpse of what I would consider the virtuoso stylistics of Spielberg a person who understands the medium of cinema as well as perhaps anybody else did of that generation. All right, so why Jaws specifically? Jaws is the film that, like Hitchcock's Psycho, Jaws becomes for Spielberg, I think, the calling card of the early part of his filmmaking. And the sequence I want to show you, for me, becomes, I suppose, the exemplar of this precocious new American filmmaker. Uh, Spielberg is going to give us everything cinema can give us in a very brief, roughly three-minute segment. Three questions I want you to consider. One, how does he use two shots to bookend the sequence? The very first shot and the final shot. Number two, really simple. I want you to think about the act of seeing. How does cinema enable us to see? And what is Spielberg doing to enable that? And the last is, and this is perhaps the most complex and interesting in Spielberg's approach to cinema, how does he construct point of view? How is he going to insert us into the point of view of his protagonist, Chief Martin Brody? So let's take a look. Hey, Mike, I know you got a lot of problems downtown, but I've got a couple of problems at the house I wish you could take care of. One, I've got some cats parking in front of the house. I can't get down to the office and that garbage truck next to the office has got to be So what I need is a red zone. It's a simple thing honey, you can take care of. You've honey, would you come here a minute, okay? please? Do it. Please. Are you okay? Everything's fine. Yeah, fine, fine. Listen, if the kids go to the water, it's really you. No. And they can, they can play out here on the beach. It's all right, let them go. It's cold. <laughs> we know all about you, Chief. You don't go in the water at all, do you? It's some bad hat, Harry. Chief Brody, you are uptight. Yes. Come on. That's it. So let's break down what's happening here. It's a very simple sequence. If I did a very conventional reading of the sequence, I would say simply this. Spielberg is using cinema in a way that it has been used for decades, which is to say he is going to align the spectator, you and I sitting at the movies in a dark theater, with the protagonist, Chief Brody. So in a conventional reading, I would say to you, this is obviously what is happening. The death of a boy, Brody sees the death, and we can feel it most intensely through his point of view. That's a very conventional reading, and it isn't adequate to the sophistication of what Spielberg is offering us. 
Cinema can see things in ways that you and I simply can't. And this is part of the foundation of the medium that Spielberg is so interested in. It's as if he wants to exaggerate visual perception in the sequence. It's not enough just to see the attack. It's not enough to see the people on the beach. He wants to put us as spectators in such a space of intensity. There's something incredibly unfamiliar and uncanny about the kind of perception Spielberg has given us in the scene. So how precisely does he do it? Well, let's go back to that opening scene I mentioned. Okay, I don't know if you recognize what you're seeing. You're seeing what looks like an extreme depth of field in a shot. Do you notice that you can see the ocean? You can see the sky, you can see the line of the horizon. It's in relative focus. You know, you can make it out. You can see the, the figure in the water calling. You can also see in screen right, in what appears to be perfect clarity, a, almost an extreme close-up of a figure. Notice the, can you see the blurry line in the middle of the screen? This is because Spielberg has composited the image. He's provided both the presence of a close-up and a long shot in the same frame. And it's why I use the term artificial before. This is as artificial as it comes. I sh this is called a split diopter shot, by the way. What he does is, Brody's having a conversation, but he's not listening to this man. He's not even interested. And Spielberg, rather than giving us the naturalism of a very deep shot, he wants it to be jarring. He wants deep space and the close-up to be a sort of jarring juxtaposition. Highly orchestrated, extremely sophisticated. He's using the medium of a cut and a suture of two images to give us what can only be described as a completely artificial mode of perception. Brody can see both images, but it's the jarring contact of those images that, 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 that strikes us as being so unusual. We move ahead through the sequence. Brody is constantly interrupted by figures. So when this old man comes and says, you don't like going in the water, it's a critical moment because Brody gets given uh, this stark confronting face right in his point of, of sight. But again, have a look at the framing of the shot. You've got Brody's screen right, foreground. You've got the man in the middle of the screen, but you've got all these kids on the left of the screen. And this is where the depth of the sequence lies. This, again, it's our vision through Brody attracted to the left of screen. This is a distraction. What I want to draw your attention to is how will this conclude? At this point, we are aligned with Brody's point of view. We've been distracted a number of times and to Brody's annoyance and to our annoyance as spectators because we want to see what threatens this beach. On a very basic level, I would say what you're seeing here is a film quotation. Uh, for those of you who love your Hitchcock and especially your Vertigo, maybe you recognize the famous Vertigo shot, which is Hitchcock's uh, contrivance of zooming in while pulling the camera out on a dolly contraption, right? So very simple. You zoom in, you pull the whole body of the apparatus out. And you get this very strange effect of a, a sort of collapsing of spatial depth. But what's much more interesting is why does Spielberg do it? And this is what I want to suggest is the greatest accomplishment of the sequence in Jaws. Spielberg is not showing us a conventional point of view. Rather, he's showing us what is specifically for him a cinematic mode of vision. He wants to exaggerate the act of seeing in a cinematic context. This is hyperbolic seeing. Cinema can enable us to see things in ways that our natural human perception simply cannot. So when Spielberg wants to give us the sense perception of what Brody is seeing, he doesn't give us a conventional point of view shot, which he could do very easily. Instead, he gives us the shot of Brody. And now perception is translated as this incredible vertigo 
zoom in, pull out shot. And I suppose if I were to interpret what it does for us as spectators or how we respond to it, I would say simply that it seems to, it seems to make our vision excessive. It seems to exceed what is natural. And the nearest point of contact that I have for it in my own film viewing it makes me think of those Warner Brothers cartoons, right? You know, when you see a wily e. coyote chasing the Roadrunner and the Roadrunner uh, tracks by at lightning speed and his eyes literally shoot out of his head and you get this crazy sort of trumpeted sound, right? And what it suggests in animation is he simply cannot believe what he's seeing. But how do you make that a part of sensation, a part of sensory perception? Well, Spielberg uses the push-pull in a quotation of vertigo to give us a sense of the incredible excess of the vision of Brody. So in summary, what have we got? On the surface, a very conventional sequence of the second attack in Jaws. But if we just scrape beneath the surface, we see that Spielberg is attuned to the capacity of cinema as a visual medium. This is something that you see in his very earliest films. If you've seen Duel, for example, uh, an early TV movie, it's an absolute masterpiece of visual and, uh, and oral composition. But in Jaws, he, he elevates the genre film to what I call, I suppose, a, a genuine American art form. It's a genre art film through Spielberg. And I suppose I'll conclude by saying that when Hitchcock described his work in Psycho, he called it a pure cinema, and by that he meant it was a cinema that was attuned to visual language. And what I've tried to illustrate here is a mode of cinema in one of the most popular filmmakers in the history of American cinema, who seems not only attuned to visual language, but who I think is one of the great imaginative filmmakers using the image and using sound to I suppose, exceed the parameters of our own perception. Uh, thanks very much for, for listening.